Now, for all intents and purposes, our prefab is just about finished. So, this is the scary part now, where we're going to start talking about the code. And, yeah, I'm sort of built up to this moment. And I'm sure there's quite a, a few people are sort of waiting for this bit, because for a lot of people, this is all explained um, fairly well by um, SL in his uh, YouTube tutorial series and the setup part. I know Ash has done a tutorial on uh, how to get set up. So a lot of what you've already seen has um, has been covered by other people um, before. So you may already have an idea of how to do that. I'm hoping you've managed to get something out of it anyway. Um, but, okay, we're going to start by now doing the code for this. Now, I'm going to go in little baby steps, so if you don't take everything in straight away, don't worry, you can go back and watch it again, um, and I will hopefully go slow enough for you to be able to understand stuff. I'm hoping that if you did want to take part in this tonight, you've, you've gone and been able to do a little bit of just background checking on a few of the basic terms that we're going to use. Um, what I'm going to do before we start is I am going to um, open up uh, Atom, which is my uh, the code writing software that I use on Mac. I think you can get Visual Studio for Mac now, and I tend to use Visual Studio when I'm working on the uh, PC on my bigger projects. Um, but Atom works really nicely for, for me, and it's the color scheme I used in the splash screen for this uh, um, uh, stream. Now this is the uh, the code that I wrote. I wrote this code this afternoon. This is Legends uh, module, the Jack Lantern, which I got the module when I woke up this morning, and by six o'clock I'd written the code. Uh, hopefully you've had you've seen that. If not, you should definitely go and check it out. Um, I'm not going to go through this code uh, because this won't mean anything to you. Uh, LED script is open because I needed to remind myself how to write TP. Look, I wrote my own TP code, which is probably terrible because I've got an array of one which is a pointless thing to have but never mind we'll get to that um, so that's all open and I'm going to open my template script which is oh where's it gone there we are uh, my template script which is I tend to keep Atom on the left of Unity as well um, which is the one that I already had in the folder and the one I'm going to be working from uh, let's pop that in there uh, Ash what are you what are you shock, shocked about um, you have to give me more than Roo shock. Um, okay, this is the outline that we're going to work from. I'm going to rewrite the script and explain what it is as we go. Okay, because um, I've already got that there, I'm going to create C sharp script, and this is what you'll be doing when you create yours. Now the one I've got open is called template script, which we I don't want it to be called because oh yeah, me writing TP code. <laughs> uh, it is a thing unheard of, but I figured it was it was a module that had all of two buttons on it, and it was either press one button or press the other button. Um, so it was remarkably straightforward for that one. I thought even I can I can't I can't take a pull request for that. Even I can manage that. Um, right, create. C sharp script. Now I have a format for how I write my uh, script names, and this is going to be called T words script. Lowercase for the first word, uppercase for subsequent words, and uppercase for script. It's important that you call this whatever you want to call it because this will automatically create it in the, as your um, as the class, which I'll get to in a sec. So let's just drag this newly created script, and if this is what you've done, because uh, you won't have this script, this template script that I've got. So hopefully you've already got this um, script to hand. You can just create that script again. So if you haven't, you can quite catch that. Right click in the project, create, and then C sharp script, and then call it whatever you like, but something useful. And then you can probably double click it from there. I'm actually going to drag it into Atom right here. And there we go. And you'll see there's some things that have already populated there, but it's not quite as populated as this one I've got over here. So the first thing you'll notice is that the name I gave it file is given it T word script. It's actually called it that in this file as well and put mono behavior in. You don't need to worry about what mono behavior is just as long as it is there. Okay, system.collections we're going to leave, systems.collections.generic we're going to leave, Unity Engine we're going to need. 
There's a few more things that you might want to use um, using system.link. Um, again, this is just my standard performer that I'm going to put at the top. Uh, you may or may not need to use system.link. Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you exactly what it does, um, what that one is for, but it's worth having in there in case we end up doing some stuff where we need it. Uh, and then using Unity Engine, that just tells you it's going to use the standard Unity components like light and um, other standard Unity components that I now can't remember. But here's a really important one that you do want, using KModKit. What this is, um, this little using directive, and we call it a using directive at the top, this is essentially going to tell us that we are using another script. I've missed one. What have I missed? I'm using system. Let's get that as well. Chuck using dot system in at the top as well because that's going to be useful for other stuff. Other stuff. Um, this essentially tells us that we are using the modkit extensions and the K modkit link is for those handy dandy. Oh yes, any all except wearing. So yes, we do definitely want to have uh, system dot link. I think I knew that. Um, I've just forgotten. Uh, yeah. So this is the bit that we want that's going to be able to get our edge work for us, so uh, how many batteries and ports and stuff are on the bomb. Okay, so, so far, so good. Public class, this is just essentially what the name of the, the script is. Um, class is a, it, it's probably more complicated than a posh word for name, but I like to think of it as a posh word for name. Now you see on the one that you've created, you've got void start and void update. We're not gonna be using update on this module. Because uh, update is um, called once per frame, as it, as it says just there. Update is called once per frame. Um, so if you're doing something like you want to know um, how many modules have been sold, if you need to know that, for example, that's a number that's constantly being updated um, over the course of the bomb, and it might change the answer to your um, uh, to, to the puzzle. It might change, give you a different answer depending on how many modules have been solved. So that's usually what we'd use update for, how many modules have been solved, how many strikes have you got, and so on. Um, but we're not going to be using that on this module, so we can just take that out completely. Start, we'll come back to later on. The start void is what is, uh, it's called, if I've got this right, I think the start method is called when it first loads, um, at, at initialization it says. So when you go into the game, you'll have, you have two methods, one's awake, I'm going to put in here, and one is start. Now, start and uh, awake is called slightly before start. I'm hazy on the difference between them. Um, Ash will give us a, um, I dare say, give us a, a proper analysis of what they are if you're asking nicely. Um, but those are your two key ones, and they're only called once awake at the very beginning and then start shortly afterwards. Before we get there, though, we've got some stuff that we're going to put in. At the top of every script, we we define our are globals. I believe these are called globals. And these are game objects that are used throughout the entire script. Um, so we need to define a couple of these. Now the basic ones I've got, we've already talked about these, KM Bon Info and KM Audio. Remember those components that we added to our object right at the beginning and then we didn't really go into any detail? Well, here's how we link them into the script. So, <coughs> excuse me. Let's do some typing. Forget about awake and forget about start for now. We'll get to them in a minute. Um, awake just after initialization, start just before its first update. Great. I'll definitely use this video where I want to start making modules. Hopefully, do something future. Excellent. I'm very glad to hear it, uh, TW Gaming. I'm glad I'm, I'm being of, of some use, genuinely. Um, now, you're, you're, you're tabbing, again, this is personal preference. On Atom, I tend to do double tab. On Visual Studio, I tend to do a single tab. But I think tabbing is very important. Um, are called globes because they can be used by both awake and start and update the present, absolutely. Um, Atom, I use double tabs. This was a, a just a, a convention I got into when I first started coding. Uh, Visual Studio, I use one, otherwise it looks massive. Whichever you're going to do, be consistent with your tabbing because it can get into a horrible, horrible mess if you don't and you end up losing brackets and it's very, very difficult to come back from it. Unless you've got Visual Studio, in which case it'll sort them all out for you. Um, right, so let's go through these first two. We're going to start by typing public. Public just means it's a, a public object which is going to be able to be accessed by other scripts. We're not going to be using directly other scripts. We're going to be referencing other scripts like this. 
Um, but more importantly, it means it's going to pop up as a little object in the inspector, which is this screen. So if we make something public, we're going to be able to directly assign something. So the things we needed were KM Audio, and we're going to call that Audio. Let me just talk through a couple of things that I've done there. Public tells you its permissions. The yellow bit that has gone yellow on mine, KM Audio, that's a, a component type. The KM Audio component could refer to, a, a, chances are it refers to a script, in this case it refers to the audio script in the, um, in the, in the mod kit. And then audio, right here, is just the name that I'm giving to it, that's how I'm going to refer to it. So, permission, what it is, and what it's called. Now, if we've done that correctly, if we go in here, uh, it's going to do a little render, a little buffer to make sure it compiles. When that clears, we know it's compiled OK. <coughs> Before we can add anything on to this script that we're creating right here, we need to add it onto our object so that it will talk to the object. And to do that, we simply take the script, the T-word script that we're using, and we drag it either directly onto T-words over there in the hierarchy or directly onto it in the inspector over there. If you go to the hierarchy, drag and drop, and you'll see it's created here. Now, that little audio component that we just made, public KM audio, audio, that can have a lowercase a. Now, because I've made a change, it's going to buffer it again. It's now expecting an object to relate to. And, of course, it's this one up here, which is already on the, on the component. So we could do something in the script, but it's far easier, I think. Click the circle and select the object that it's attached to. So that's what's happening there. This It wants to know, OK, I'm using this script. Where is this script in your program? And then down here, you tell it, well, it's attached to this object. And if we check, it is attached to that object because we added it on earlier on. So that's what that is. It's the same thing when we go public uh, km bomb info. And we're going to call this bomb. <coughs> the semicolon at the end of the line tells us that is the end of this line of code. So the semicolon acts as a, as, as a break, essentially. Uh, I'm sure there's a more specific meaning than that. But um, for all intents and purposes, at the end of the line, you want a semicolon. Not always, as you'll see. But when defining variables and globals at the top, you definitely do Public KM bomb info bomb. Okay, and that's that's your, your basic setup. If you go back in here, now bomb is going to turn up and we can go boop and T words. We want to use this bomb info script which is attached to our prefab. Good night Porku, thank you for tuning in. Um, make sure you watch the VOD on catch up another time. Okay, next. Um, okay, these three things here are mainly to do with um, logging, apart from the last one which I added myself. Um, I always put these at the bottom of my defined globals, um, which is a, a posh way of saying that the last thing that I put in before I actually start the logic of the program. Let me go through these. Static int. Now, an int is an integer, which is a a whole number. It's, um, one of the most basic forms of um, programming language you can use, they're very, very helpful. Um, a static int is an int that, and Ash is going to come to my rescue here, it's an int that cannot be changed by any other script, but can only be changed by the parent script, I think. Something like that. Um, how long has the stream been running? I've been going for about two and a half hours, um, TW, um, with a 15 minute break in the middle. Uh, so, a static int, module ID counter. This is mainly to do with the logging, so when you're pushing stuff through the log file analyzer, um, it will uh, log it properly and, and, and can read it properly. Uh, int, uh, module ID, again, that is defined somewhere else in the logging. A private ball module solved is something that I've, I've been... These two you basically don't need to worry about. Once I give you the line for the logging that you're going to need, 
you don't need to worry about what these are and what these do. They just have to sit there in the program, in the in the in the um, in the class. A private ball. Now, a ball is something that can either be true or false. If you've got a private ball, now this one is uh, a static thing. Is something that belongs to the class itself and not instances of the class. I'll only ever be the one of that thing in the entire program in essence. Fab. Um, so Ash has explained it much better than than I did there. This this integer here, this ID counter one, belongs to this class, this script that I'm writing. Um, I can't duplicate it anywhere else. Um, whereas this I this integer I could. Um, now, a ball is something that can either be true or false. It's useful for, as a, a sort of locking mechanism. Once something has happened, in this case, once the module has been solved, I can set this to true and make it so that it does or doesn't do certain stuff, depending on whether that is or isn't the case. Now, um, a private ball uh, means I won't be able to access this in other scripts, which is fine, because I don't need to access it in any other scripts, because I'm only going to be using this one. Um, but it also means I won't be able to act... Um, access it in the inspector. So I won't be able to see at a glance in here, without logging it, whether it's true or false. Which is kind of fine, because I don't really need to know that, um, as long as I'm sort of keeping track of that um, myself. By default, a boolean, which is what bool is short for, uh, will default to false. So if I go like that, that's a waste of, um, of typing. I don't need to do that. If I wanted to start as true, I would go like that, equals true. But again, permission, what the object is, in this case a bool or a boolean, and what I've called it. So later on, if I want to um, make that true down here, I could just go module solve. It already knows it's a boolean because I've defined it up there, equals true. And that will set that to true. Um, zero false null or empty um, and Ash is absolutely right and the other thing actually you'll notice here that these are public this is private these are neither um, if you don't put anything on again it will default to, to private as, as, a, as a rule okay <coughs> so so far hopefully um, I've not gotten anybody too lost so far uh, hopefully you've followed that at the moment as long as you've sort of copy pasted what's on my screen you should be okay um, the next thing I'm going to do is add in my selectables. Now, my selectables were these four buttons up here, which is normally what a selectable is going to be. There are two different ways you can add a selectable in. Uh, I have a preferred way, which I've developed, which certainly wasn't my preferred way when I first started coding. When you first start coding, you're probably going to want to do it this way and keep everything very separate. So public, so you can access it in the inspector. KM selectable. That's the object. It's a KM selectable, the, the selectable component of the of the mod kit. And we're going to call this button one. That's what I'm going to call it, so I know what it is. Save my code. And when I go over back to the inspector, I'm going to pop up down here, button one. Now, button one was this one. That's where the selectable is. It's on the surface right there. So that is what I want to drag into there. Alternatively, I can click the circle and select it that way. When you've got lots and lots of selectables, that can get kind of fiddly and messy. Um, <coughs> excuse me, so the, the dragging way can be more efficient, just showing you there are many ways to skin a cat, so to speak. Word surface one, that is my selectable. Now, that means any time I refer to button one in this code, it's talking about that specific button there. That one, the tattered, one that's currently tatterdemalion. So far, so good, I hope. Now, what, of course, you'd want to do from there is do your other ones, button two, button three, button four. And I'm just copy-pasting the script to speed it up. Now, what I might do, because I want to... Oh, I've got an error. Now, you'll see I've got an error here, which means it won't compile the script. Now, if this happens, if you think, I've just put in button two, button three, button four... Why is it not letting me update it in the script? Check your console out, because the chances are you've made an error somewhere. Type or namespace KM selectable could not be found. Um, Ash, you're not allowed to answer this. Um, will this nice me into different chunks post recording will remain in its original length? It will be split up, almost certainly split up into chunks uh, for YouTube, TW. 
Um, Ash is not allowed to answer this. I'm inclined to not let River answer this either, but anyone else who doesn't already have previous... Uh, Twitch, it generally says is one chunk. Yes, it will, but I will put it onto YouTube in different chunks. Anyone who has done coding before, or has done modding before, is not allowed to answer it. So, Ash and River, that discounts you. But someone else, tell me, why has this code not compiled? I've made an error in it. Can you tell me what it is? I'll give you a, a point to it again. It's telling me here, I've got an error on line 14, line 15, and line 16. And it's telling me, KM Selectable could not be found. It doesn't know what KM Selectable is. So what have I done wrong there? Just an opportunity for me to stop talking for a minute. <laughs> Very good, TW has got the answer. It's supposed to be KM Selectable. Now you guys say, what well, it is KM Selectable. The difference is though, the first one has a capital S, the other ones don't. And this is something you'll realize very, very quickly, case sensitivity. Case sensitivity is very, very, very important. All right. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later on, about what the difference between that and that is. Normally that would be followed by, um, and that would be followed by that and preceded by that. But we'll, um, we'll get to that in a little while. All in good time, all in good time. So, now, it's gonna compile okay. And we'll go down and we'll set button two, button three, and button four. So what I've now got, I've now got four different references to my buttons and I can make them do different things depending on what I want them to do. But at the moment, they're not going to do anything at all because I haven't told them to do anything. Uh, this is a hard way while probably my... Ooh, JavaScript. Yuck. Um, and this is where I'm going to come to the awake script and this bit here, which looks a bit scarier because it's greyed out. Um, it's greyed out because um, I don't want it to do anything at the moment. You'll notice I've got um, slash asterisk slash and slash asterisk slash that greys out the selection in between it. You can do a single double slash to grey out a single line. That means the code won't read that particular line um, and it will just bypass it and go straight on to the next one. Okay, um, so there are two main things here. Module ID equals module ID counter plus plus. Again, that's one of those things that just needs to sit there and you really don't need to worry about it. It's to do with the larger scale of the bomb and the, the log file analyzer just so it can give the the, um, the the particular instance of the module on the bomb a reference number. You don't need to worry about it, you just need to know that it sits there and it stays there. Incidentally, this file that I'm creating for you here and demonstrating what to do with, this is part of my template. All right, all of this I, I build in as, as standard into my template so I don't have to do this every time. These obviously I do, but um, that will be there as standard. This awake method will be here as standard. Uh, and so on. I've just used a word that you might not know what it means, method. A method is basically a little chunk of code that does a job. And you can send the code around the place to different methods so it does a particular thing. Now the awake method, which is this bit here between these curly braces and has the nice purple subheading, is a void, which means it doesn't return any values. It just runs the script, does what it says in the script, and then comes out. The same with start. You can have different types of method. Um, the most basic one you'll use apart from a void is probably uh, a coroutine or an I enumerator. I'm not going to be doing that today. I was 11 modules in before I even touched I enumerators, and they're mainly fixed with um, delaying stuff and putting time on stuff. We don't need to worry about that for this one. As long as you know that this is a method, this highlighted bit here, this is the type of method that it is, in this case a void, which is the most basic one and that's the name of the method. Awake is a standard method name. Um, it's a recognized name by the language, C Sharp, but most of our methods are gonna be things that we invent ourselves. Um, and the little parentheses at the end, the, 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 the regular brackets, they are just a, an indicator that this is a method they invoke or send you to the method. Let's see what people have got to say. Is there a program that is in case sense of it's a function. Yes, indeed, it is, TW. 
Um, uh, commenting outline, so friends to read it. Yes, uh, Gibbous wearing man, I'm going to call you Gibbous. Um, the slash asterisk slash, um, it greys out the line so that the code doesn't read it. So at the moment, this, for all intents and purposes, isn't here as far as the code is concerned. It's not there. Um, however, we're going to make it there. Um, I'm going to show you two ways to do this. I'm going to show you the way that you'll want to start doing it and the way I started doing it. Um, and then I'm going to show you why that is not the way you want to do things. And I'm going to pull up a script to show you why that is. Um, iPhone is a good example of that. Uh, because I was still quite early on when I was doing this. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, it's fairly hideous. Um, so, if you've only got a little module that's only got four buttons, you can afford to do them as separate buttons, just so you can keep track of them. You might find it easier to see what's going on. Now, to get that button to do something when you click it, you need to give it a piece of code. And this is this little piece of code here that I've just uh, revealed for you. Now, I am still slightly hazy on exactly what this means because this is a leftover day from, as I say, this is in my template. I don't know exactly, I have a rough idea how it works, but I don't know exactly how it works. Um, I just know that it does. So, button, that's the name of the button. In fact, actually, we're going to call it button one. Dot on interact, that means when you interact with it, is going to delegate, which I think means it's going to send it to somewhere. In this case, it's going to send it to this method, press button, which we haven't got yet, and then it's going to return false. I've no idea what that bit does at the end. Just go with me on this. Uh, and again, I can make this script publicly available, so you can just copy this. This is one of those bits. You don't really need to know how it works. You just need to know it works. Okay. Um, and in a minute, I'll show you the, the slightly more uh, advanced one. The jack-o'-lantern. Yes, the jack-o'-lantern got done in a couple of hours this afternoon. Uh, so, in this case, button 1 on interact, we want it to go to a method called press button 1, with parentheses on the end. I don't have that method at the moment, so I'm going to create it. Void, press button 1, and parentheses, to make sure I know it's a method. Press enter, and then my curly brackets, and notice it will give me the closing curly bracket, enter. And that method is now created. So what this means, what this essentially does, it on awake, as soon as the program starts, it's going to say, right, button one, when you press it, I'm going to do whatever function is in this method down here. Now, I've already told the computer what button one is up here. I've already told the script what it is and what it links to. Um, I can't see the lower parts of the code because of the face cam. Right, thank you for pointing that out. It's time for me to go away. Go over there, Royal Flush, for now. I'm going to put myself there. If that proves to be even more in the way, then <coughs> let me know. I might just put myself into the top corner. I'll move myself once I go back into the inspector in a minute. Um, so, uh, press button one. Now, what do we want it to do when we press button one? Well, we can make it do any number of things. You're declaring somewhat an anonymous method, and you're retrieving the delegate that corners for that anonymous method. Great. Um, I'm still not. I'm not hundred percent sure what Ashley just said there, but um, it sounds it sounds right. <laughs> I trust you on that. Okay. So press button. What do we want it to do? Well, for now, let's just do a basic thing. Let's get it to write a message to the console. Now, the console, um, as we've already pointed out. Oh, where have I gone? Ah, I've changed my screen now. The console is this bit down here, the bit that tells us where there's errors and, and so on, which I'm just going to clear out for you now. So press button one. To get a message in there, we're going to go debug dot log, note the capital letters as well, open parentheses, speech marks. And then whatever I type in there is going to print to the log. Uh, so in this case, congratulations on writing your first bit of code. Here's a message for you. Message. Okay, so hopefully you've followed what I've done there. This is uh, button one, and I have to find it in the inspector in there. 
here is a piece of code that says when you press button one, whatever button one you've whatever you've assigned button one to, I want you to go down to this method here. When you get to this method here, it's going to run this method, and that is going to print that message. Shall we see if it works? Let's save. Load up my glass with a bit more wine. Oh, we've got an error. We've got an error on line 42. Someone's going to tell me what I've done wrong on line 42. Other than Ash. What have I done wrong? Good man, Jerry Ennis. We need and Gibbous as well. We Jerry Ennis. So yes, we need a semicolon because, as I said before, it's the end of a line. We need a semicolon. Um, can I just add at this point, if you feel that um, I'm being slightly patronising, I'm not intending to be. I'm, I'm just trying to sort of channel my uh, inner teacher with a, you know, obviously with a glass of wine. Um, I'm just trying to make it as slightly more interactive. Uh, a to save my voice, and B just so it's not just me talking at a screen for for hours. Um, and also, if I'm asking questions, then it means um, I know that I'm actually, if you're understanding it, uh, and I'm asking you questions, then that's that, that's good. Um, hopefully, you're not all already expert coders. If you are, then great. But if, if you're not, then that, that's good if you're, you're picking stuff up, which is good. Um, so we need a semicolon to indicate the end of the line. I'm going to save it. We're going to go back, and it's going to compile for us. Now, I told the inspector that um, this right here, this one was button one, uh, word surface one, battery's down to 10% on the phone. Every time Raw does anything with wine. <laughs> yeah, quite. Um, so when we click that button, or word, whatever you want to call it, it should give us a little message. That does nothing, that does nothing. That does nothing. Congratulations for writing your first bit of code. Here is a message for you message. And we can click that many, many times. And it's going to give us that message every time. So there we go. That's our first little bit of bit of code. We're just debugging to the console. Um, uh, I'm something of a moderate thinking. Yeah, get to play with one, absolutely. So, that's not the most interesting thing in the world, but it is something that's, you know, quite good. And of course we can do the same thing oops, with each of these, if I just copy and paste these down here, and change these to button 2, button 3, button 4, and press button 2, press button 3, press button 4. I can then copy this method down here. I'm going to change this message to something a bit more real, um, practical. You press button one and obviously this needs to be a different method because we've renamed the method and we can call this uh, you press button two and so on if we copy these down again we'll call this press button three and press button four button three button four obviously we go back into the inspector we're going to need to assign those just as we did before Oh no, we don't. We've already done that, of course we have. And then we hit play. And we go down to the screen. You press button 1, you press button 2, you press button 3, you press button 4. Okay? Basic stuff, but we know it works. Let's get it to report something a little bit more interesting. Let's say we want it to report this word um, that is on the, on the text right here. Um, to do that, we're going to need to add something to this log. You press plus. Uh, and again, I'm not entirely sure that this is perhaps the best thing for me to show you straight away when there's more stuff I can be showing you, but this is quite a fun thing that's going to come in handy later on. You can link different bits of logging. So <coughs> we add a plus in there. And what I want it to do is actually report the word that's on the button. So to do that, we're going to go um, uh, button one dot get component 
in children. What that is, is going to, to, going to grab one of the components that is uh, inside button one. So button one is this, the children of button one are these. And we want to get one of these components uh, and we want to get this text mesh because we want to get whatever this says. So get component in children, pointy brackets, text mesh, close pointy brackets, circle brackets, uh, dot text. So what that essentially says is you pressed space and then whatever this is, this function here. So button one, get component in children. Um, so many words, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, again, this is probably not the, the, the most logical thing for me to show you straight away, but it's quite a good thing to, to know about. Get component in children means it's going to, all, it, all, it, all this is saying is that instead of getting um, this button, this component here, the selectable, it's going to get one of its children. In this case, the text mesh, which is the one right there. Um, and we're just gonna copy that down below. Plus button two, plus button three, and then button four. Now, hopefully, I'm not going to have egg on my face with a really embarrassing compiler error here, but let's go save. Have a look. Hopefully, it will compile. It does indeed. And now, if we hit play, and we go, let's say you pressed tap to Malian. You press Tam and Dua, you press Taphrogenesis, you press Tabernacular. So, um, uh, are the numbers required? The numbers are required because at the moment we want to talk about getting the components inside button one. We want to get the component inside button two and get the component inside button three when we press the buttons because remember they're inside these individual button methods. And only taking children since two minutes ago, absolutely. <laughs> um, so that's why we have button four. That's just what I've called them. I could have called this um, bonfire flower puff. And down there we could call that bonfire flower puff. And it would do exactly the same thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll ask Ashton Bash something unrelated. No, that's cool. Um, but for now, I'm going to call that button one. Now... All of that is all, all fine. I'm, I'm just showing you how the, how the debugger works there and, and how you can log stuff in the, uh, in, in, into the console, which is very useful to, to have. Um, and you've got your four different buttons that are going to do different things depending on when you press them. You might not want to have four different buttons, though, and you might not want to have four different methods if all those buttons do, broadly speaking, the same thing. If all those buttons do, broadly speaking, the same thing, then you can collate all of that information into a single bit of code, a single global object, and a single method. So what I've just shown you is the basic introduction to what um, assigning methods to, um, to objects and to buttons and to selectables. And that is an absolutely fine way to get started coding. If you've only got three buttons and when you press that button, you want it to do something, if you press that button, you want it to do something else, that's fine, if that's what you want it to do. I am going to show you a more advanced method um, in case you want to try that out. Also, I find it streamlines the code and makes it a lot easier to read and to manage. Um, because if you do have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of objects on your thing, like, for example, iPhone, which has got the home screen, and then six different screens within that. If you're doing every, imagine um, the, the phone number digits, for example, if each one of those was an individual selectable, you've got 10 straight away, and then you've got the pin code screen, there's another 10 in there straight away, and then you've got four Angry Birds, and then you just see what I mean, suddenly you're starting to get lots and lots and lots of things. And this is what happens if you end up doing something like that. You get masses and masses of code. So you've got, um, pin, home screen buttons, my Angry Bird buttons all separately, messages, photos, Tinder, phone, you can see all of these are separate selectables, settings, um, 
wallpapers, <coughs> and so on. And I look back at this now, and I only wrote this code in February, February, March, so not that long ago. And I'm looking at this, and I'm feeling physically ill looking at it, thinking, what on earth were you doing, um, doing all of those selectables? And that's, that's fine to do that, because I've had another eight months coding experience, and I've come, you know, developed a lot more in, in what I can do. If you were to create something like this right now, that would be absolutely fine for you. If that's the first thing you've created, that's brilliant because you can see it on the page and it makes a lot of sense. Um, what's the code not have any buttons on it? Yeah, apart from the back button, which um, then the back button, of course, is a, uh, a standard one that goes on the home screen, which is there, public game acceptable home. All right. So in order to stop having so many things here, because it's, it's just... You know, it's line 160 before the code even even actually starts. Um, I wrote jack-o'-lanterns earlier and the whole thing. In fact, when I wrote um, plunger button and over the weekend, I think that the whole code was about 102 lines. Um, so, you know, going down to 160 before you've actually even started the code um, means you're going to end up with codes that are nearly 2,000 lines long. And that's not really something that you want because um, it's not particularly manageable um, so that's what happens so to avoid that you can use a different object instead of using a km selectable object you can use what's called an array of km selectable objects or an array of anything now what's that Ash? oh you're, you're talking about something else that's fine carry on um, now, an array, an array object, is basically multiple amounts of the same object. So, what I'm going to do, uh, if I want, if I know I've got four KM selectable objects in my code, instead of having four separate objects, I can have one object that has got four um, bits to it, four, four levels to it, essentially. Um, so, here, I'm actually going to call this words rather than buttons um, and you'll see what will happen once I've done that is that the code will compile and you see when I got the buttons it gave me a little box to put it in now when I load up words it gives me a little drop down menu and this array can be as long or as short as I like it could be 10 if I've got 10 buttons it could be 3 if I've got 3 buttons it could be as you might see a bit later on when I do an array 47 or 20, or in this case, what we actually want, 4. Now, again, uh, ah, why the square brackets? Thank you, good question, I forgot to do that. Um, the square brackets basically say, this is an array. So, yeah, so that, that's the array. Without the square brackets, it would just be a single instance of a KM selectable, and it would come up looking like that. With the square brackets, it's going to turn it into an array, so I can define how long it is and how many objects of that type I want within this array. Okay, so in this case I want four um, objects. You can do it if it's a private array, like you're not putting it into the inspector, you can do it like this, uh, type selectable array equals new, km selectable array, and then the number goes in there. Um, but one of the reasons I quite like to keep my uh, selectables defined publicly is so that I can keep track of exactly how long they're going to be. Came selectable words, which is right there. So two ways of doing this again. You can either click and drag the selectable into the little slots you've made, like that. Two. Oh. Oh, I didn't make it in a row. No. I didn't mind that. So let's turn it back and try. So again, let's define the the size of the array. It's four. Hello, dear. My wife's just got home from walking the dog. How are you feeling? Not so good. She's been very poorly recently. So, stream. I'm sure the stream will send their love, <laughs> and she sends her love back to you. Um, okay. So as I've said, you can either do drag and drop, drag and drop, which is fine if you've only got four. But if you've got like a, a calculator which has got ten buttons on it, um, or some of the stuff I've done in my 
my uh, the jigsaw house project that I'm doing at the moment. I've got, I've got like a 50, 50 long array, and it's a real bore to put them all in. So what you can do is just set it all to zero, lock, select, and drag. And that will give you, uh, just automatically populate that array with the exact amount that you that you want. In this case, I want four. Uh, lots of love from the stream. I'm sure she's very grateful for that. Okay, now just as before, we want to set it up to do something when we click it. Now here we did it individually, a line for each button, and that's fine. And then we've got a method for each button. What we want to have is one method for all the buttons and one essentially block of code for each. Now this is a block of code that uh, Ash the Bash gave me, not that long ago actually, uh, it's a couple of months or so. And it's a it's a for each statement. Um, I'm not going to explain the details of a for each right here, I'm going to do it very loosely just so you get an idea of what's going on. Um, but what a for each does, it's, it's a loop and it will do something a certain number of times. Now uh, a for loop something that is defined like this. There. Yeah. Um, I can't type. So that's a for loop. Now that's a loop that you can say how many times you want it to, to check something. In this case, I want to check it 10 times because um, it starts at zero and goes up to nine. A for each loop will check um, uh, check for the amount of things that are in an array. So in this case, um, uh, and uh, this is just my default setup, so I need to just tweak it. For each KM selectable, so that's the type, and then we need to give it a, a local name, so we're just gonna call it um, word, in words, what's it called? We called it words. So for each of the KM selectables, which we're gonna call word, in words, I hope that makes sense so far. So for each, for every single KM selectable that there is, one of these objects, which we'll call word in words, which is up here, which in this case is four. So it's gonna be this four times. We can now do something with this thing that we've defined word. Um, so I'm just gonna undo it because I've called it object before. Um, KM selectable, Pressed object, so that's a new thing we're creating there, a new KM selectable, pressed word equals word. What this essentially does is it goes through it, it checks which one you pressed and then gives it a new thing. In this case, calling it pressed word. It makes it a new object, whichever one you pressed. It's a local object, um, so it gets rid of it once it's done. You don't need to worry too much about it. And then we've got the same bit of code, word.oninteract, whichever one it is, uh, delegate, we'll call this WordPress, lol, pressed word, because that's what we called it there. And again, this is this is the advanced stuff, you don't necessarily need to do it this way, it's just a different way, I think it's a slightly more efficient way of doing it. Um, and then we can go void, down here, start up a new method, um, WordPress, uh, what am I doing, why have I put parentheses down there? Uh, void wordpress open parentheses and now we're passing an object through which I'm just going to jump back what it is uh, came selectable word now what that little bit in brackets does at the end there it takes a value from up here and passes it into this method so now whatever we call word will be whatever we pressed up here Goes through each possible object in the array, whichever is true, except when you look at it. Correct, T.W. That's a much better way of describing it. I think I'm over my. I just learned about this comprehension. I want to use them for everything. Face. <laughs> yeah, it's um, when you, when you get the knack of doing it this way. I did it for um, the jack o' lantern I did earlier on, um, and that had two. That's got two buttons on the module, and that's it. And I did an an array for those, just because I couldn't be asked to write two separate methods. Um, so I just did, did, did one method and it works much much better um, and more efficiently so now I've done that I can actually get rid of these methods that I wrote here I can get rid of these interactions that I wrote here and I can get rid of these selectables up here 
and I'm now at this point. And I'm hoping, if you're following me, that this is not is not delved into another language other than C sharp, um, and it's still reason making a reasonable amount of sense to you. Um, I don't know why I've lost the space there. Let's get rid of that. So now it's going to redefine this code. Hopefully, I won't have any compiler errors. Doesn't look like it. And see, they've all gone now, and I've just got my four words. Now, I've only got my one method now. So if I now do a debug.log, which we learned about before, debug.log, and we're going to say the word you press is space plus. Now, we need to know which word we've pressed. The variable that we've passed through is called word. Word. And that is essentially just replacing the button one, button two that we had before. And we can do exactly the same thing then. Get component in children, uh, pointy brackets, text mesh, circle brackets, dot text, uh, semicolon. Now that is going to do exactly the same thing as before, but it's using a quarter of the code. So we go back and we let it compile. We hit play. And suddenly, you press the word you press is Tafdamalian, the word you press is Tamdua, and that's doing all this from the same line of script, uh, from the same uh, method, rather. Um, which is just a much more efficient way of, of tracking the code, which is, of course, what we want to do.